talking about creation. Now, a lot of evangelicals, when we get to the Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 accounts, they can kind of wonder, what do we do with these accounts? Many people are older creationists, and many people have a position that someone might say, well, how can, that seems outside the bounds, that's what's known as evolutionary creationism, but it's becoming more and more popular view. I have my own sympathies with it as well. And for you all who are listening up here, you should probably know by now, my stance on this is I hold to an old earth. Everything else after that is a jump bar. And the conclusion wouldn't impact me seriously in any way, but it is an interesting discussion, and I'll leave it to the scientists. But there was a book that came out earlier this year called um, Old Earth or Evolutionary Creation. And it was edited by... Kenneth Keefley, J.B. Stump, and Joe Aguirre. And on the show, we got representatives from the two organizations that were discussing in the book back and forth, Biologos and Reasons to Believe. And we got one of the editors who wasn't probably by, I don't think, Ken Keefley here, who's kind of, I think, going to be overseeing things with me here. Um, let's uh, get to our guest, and let's start with you, Dr. Keefley. You're, this, is, this is your first time on the show here. You are a senior professor of theology and the Jesse Henley Chair of Theology at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, where you've been teaching since 2006. You also direct the L.S. Bush Center for Faith and Culture, a center that seeks to engage culture, present and defend the Christian faith, and explore its implications for all areas of life. He is a co-author of 40 Questions About Creation and Evolution, Frago in November 2014, and you're a co-editor of Old Earth Revolutionary Creation, discussing origins with reasons to believe in biologos from IVP July of this year. And you and your wife Penny have been married since 1980. That's the year I was born. So that really makes things pretty interesting. That means, that means I'm an old guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got married when I was born. Yeah. You live in Wake Forest, North Carolina, and are members of North Wake Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina. You have a son and daughter, both married, and four grandchildren. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Keefley. Thank you, Nick. Glad to be here. If my audience doesn't know much about you, can you tell us a bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing? Well, I've always been interested, even during my time as a pastor, in uh, faith science mm-hmm. issues, particularly as it relates to uh, creation and creationism. Uh, even in the early days when I was a pastor, I was very involved in the young earth creationist movement. Um, mm-hmm. my, my local church in which I was a pastor uh, served as a satellite uh, for a, um, a creationist ministry out of Australia that was sort of the precursors of, of uh, Answers in Genesis and, and several like that, Clifford Wilson and others. Uh, so, so I had um, a lot of involvement with the early uh, young Earth creationist. Um, I journeyed away from Young Earth creationism uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, as I was uh, continuing my education, I uh, did a degree in mathematics, and uh, then during my seminary time, whenever I was finishing my doctorate, uh, I moved over to uh, Old Earth creationism. So I have been teaching on creation and creationism uh, at. Uh, Southern Baptist Seminaries now for almost 20 years. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is the second book for me to be involved uh, either in editing or writing. And uh, also uh, directing the Bush Center for Faith and Culture. Uh, it, to, the mandate for the center is rather broad because you think there's just not hardly any er- arena in which our faith does not engage the culture. Uh, so, so the Bush Center will address a number of issues, whether mm-hmm. it's political, social, ethical, things of that nature, uh, even art and, and film. Mm. Um, but one area that is very significantly uh, uh, where, where, where our faith uh, interacts uh, with the world is in the arena of the natural sciences. Mm. So the Bush Center often uh, sponsors some type of events in which we uh, engage in those kinds of questions. Hey, we're very good to have you here. And like what you're helping out with this discussion here as well. Glad to do it. Let's move on here. Dr. Stump, this is your second time on the show. Uh, you came on here originally with Dr. Applegate about your book, How I Changed My Mind on Evolution. Yeah, you're uh, the uh, 
senior editor at Biologos. You oversee the development of new content and curate existing content website and print materials. You have a PhD in philosophy from Boston University, and you were formerly a philosophy professor and academic administrator. You've offered science and Christianity an introduction to the issues and edited four views on creation, evolution, and intelligent design, and co-authored or co-edited books including Christian Thought, a Historical Introduction, Black Will Companion to Science and Christianity, How I Changed My Mind About Evolution, and when we're discussing today, Old Earth Revolutionary Creation, Discussing Origins with Reasons to Believe in Biologos. So, uh, Dr. Stump, welcome back to the Deeper Waters podcast. Thanks, Nick. Good to be here again. In case my audience is hearing this for the first time and don't remember your last appearance, tell us a little bit about how you got to be doing what you're doing. Sure. I uh, So I grew up in a Christian family, and my father was trained as a science teacher. And uh, I followed in his footsteps in that regard. As an undergraduate, I majored in science education. And just after I graduated then from college, my wife and I actually moved to uh, Sierra Leone, West Africa, and taught in a mission school. And while I was there, I started reading a lot more than I did in my uh, science education and got really interested in philosophy and apologetics kinds of questions. And when we came back then, I decided to go to grad school in philosophy. And within the discipline of philosophy was particularly interested in questions having to do with science. So did an MA and then a PhD focusing on uh, history and philosophy of science. And I taught then for a number of years as a philosophy professor at a Christian liberal arts college here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And when Biologos uh, moved to Grand Rapids in 2013, when Deborah Harzma became president, she was looking for a few other people to work with her. And so I started working part-time for Biologos in that regard. I've used philosophy as, as a lens on the science and religion discussion, our way into it, and uh, became more and more involved. And then starting in 2015, I've been working full-time for Biologos now. Well, good to have you back. I hope this will be an interesting discussion. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Rana, Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe. You know, we've had on Hugh Ross a couple of times. We've had Ken Sampras on, so I guess it's about time that you came on here. Mm-hmm. And Fuzz Rana is a vice president of research and apologetics at Reasons to Believe. He's the author of several groundbreaking books, including Who Was Adam, Creating Life in the Lab, The Cell Design and Dinosaur Blood, and The Age of the Earth. He holds a PhD in chemistry even emphasis in biochemistry from Ohio University. So welcome for the first time to the Deeper Waters podcast. Nick, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be with you. Mm-hmm. Now, if my, my audience doesn't know much about you, tell us how you got to be doing what you're doing. Well, uh, science played an integral role in my conversion to Christianity. I was an agnostic um, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, taking courses in chemistry and biology, preparing myself to go to graduate school. And in fact, I embraced the evolutionary paradigm. And uh, when I say paradigm, I mean the grand narrative that evolutionary mechanisms can account for the entirety of life. And yet when I was uh, a graduate student immersing myself in the study of the cell's chemical systems, I was deeply impressed with the, the ingenuity and the sophistication of those systems and began to wonder how do we account for their origin uh, and as I looked at original life explanations that were in play at that time, I uh, just simply saw them to be inadequate. And it was at that point I was convinced there ultimately had to be a mind that undergirded life. And then that opened me up to questions like, who is the creator? How do I relate to the creator? And it was a pastor's challenge uh, to read the Bible for the first time that introduced me to the Gospels and ultimately to the person of Christ. And so I uh, converted to Christianity, and I've always been interested in science faith issues, but this really came to a head for me uh, when I was working uh, in research and development for Procter & Gamble a number of years ago now. And my father, who was a Muslim, I grew up in a Muslim home, died as a Muslim, and I just simply was never able to really reach him as a Christian, and I realized that apologetics was going to be very important that I needed to equip myself so that I could give reasons to people for the hope that I had. But it also convinced me that evangelism was really important. And uh, doors just began to open for me as I reached those those convictions. And that 
led to an opportunity to join Reasons to Believe now almost 19 years ago, working alongside Hugh Ross, Ken Samples, Jeff Zwierink, and Anjanette Roberts now mm -hmm. as uh, science and, and, and philosophy colleagues. Uh, but, you know, our organization is ultimately about using science as a way to build a bridge uh, to the gospel. And so that's uh, what we're motivated to do. We're not interested in developing apologetics arguments for the sake of developing arguments. We really see our mission as being evangelism and equipping the church to use science as a way to, again, connect people to the Christian message. We're good to have you here also, and I guess I should take it as a good sign that two of your other colleagues have been on, and it didn't scare you from coming on as well. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Nobody gave me the warning not to go on that the podcast <laughs> no matter what. So, <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, start looking into this book. And I'd like to start with a question for you, Dr. Keefley, and it's one I'm sure I'm going to get from some people if I don't ask it, because yes. people of all perspectives are listening to my show, so... I think someone could be wondering, why isn't young earth creationism included in the book? Why is it just old earth versus <laughs> evolutionary creationism? Well, uh, I think there's a, a number of reasons why. Uh, for one thing, uh, to start, I have co-authored books with uh, young earth creationists. The 40 Questions on Creation and Evolution is co-authored with uh, Mark Rooker, uh, who is a wonderful colleague with me at uh, Southeastern Seminary here in Wake Forest. Mm. And and Mark is a young earth creationist, and we work together very well and have a very cordial relationship. So mm -hmm. it isn't that I, uh, I haven't ever worked uh, with young earth creationists. And right. in fact, uh, there are times some of the events that we have at the Bush Center are discussions. Uh, uh, let's see, the one we had last spring uh, was with a young earth creationist, uh, Nathaniel Jeanson, and an uh, an evolutionary creationist, uh, Dennis Venema. At other times, we've had young Earth and old Earth. So I didn't feel that every time I have an event or uh, every time I am involved in a project, I have to have every party involved. Mm -hmm. There are particular reasons in this book that we don't have young Earth creationists uh, involved because this book is specifically a dialogue between those who do accept the findings of science concerning the age of the earth. Uh -huh. uh, in other words, uh, we didn't want this to have to, to, we didn't want to go through those questions uh, and address those issues again. We wanted to move beyond that and have a discussion of other issues besides that. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, for that reason, we uh, decided to have it simply uh, between old earth creationists and evolutionary creationists. Yeah. Uh, and, your your intro kind of uh, highlighted the reason why the, we have this book. You said, I'm an old earth creationist. Everything beyond that is sort of a jump ball. Right. Well, that's exactly the kind of issues we wanted to address. What, right. what, what kind of issues then uh, are pertinent to those of us who do accept what science has to say in the fields of geology or, or, or astronomy? Mm. So uh, it wasn't an idea of, of shutting anyone out. This was right. just simply this, this was the nature of our conversation. Yeah, I agree. If you just wanted to ask for the sake of people out there listening and such, it, it is a great book. And for me, my stance on Genesis 1 is I pretty much go with John Walton's view, which I was very thrilled when I saw that he had some chapters in here. And as for the science says, well, I leave it to the scientists, but it's an interesting debate. Anyway, and during the show, and when you have a something you'd like to chime in with for questions or something you'd like to ask as well to our guests that you think I might be missing, feel free to jump in and say it. I, I appreciate your opinion from a much more wise or older perspective. <laughs> All right. Ken, I think it might be worthwhile talking something about the history of the dialogue here, too. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah out, that's a good point. Okay. I, I, uh, during the course of the dialogue, mm -hmm. we did ask, do we want to involve young earth creationists? And so, so it, it wasn't just that uh, we just forgot to involve them. Yeah. On the other hand, there is a historical context here. Mm -hmm. Are there, in, in other words, uh, this, this book began as a conversation between Daryl Falk and some of Biologos and Hugh Ross and some uh, at, uh, involved with Reasons to Believe, I believe, it may have been at Hugh's house, even. I, I, I'm, my memory 
uh, may fail me there. And also, at about the time they were having their conversation, Daryl Falk, who at that time was the president of Biologos, and I began a dialogue. We had met at Pepperdine uh, at a at a conference. Uh, we ended up having some things that we did together. Uh, we did a series of blog posts called Southern Baptist Voices, in which a number of Southern Baptist professors wrote some of their concerns, and uh, those of Biologos replied. So... There, you know, there there is a a context, a historical context, in which this book came about, which lent itself to a conversation among uh, those of us who held to an old earth. Uh, so, so Jim, you're right to bring that up. But during the time that we had our conversation, we we asked, do, do we want to broaden the conversation? And we decided f- that for this conversation, it was better not to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And. I think the, the format of the book actually works very well. For those who don't know, it's someone from, I believe, the Southern Baptist Convention making a statement, opening a chapter, asking a question about a viewpoint and such, and then someone from Biologos and someone from Reasons to Believe each writes an essay, and the the person then looks at them and says, well, here are some points of report. Here's a question I'd like to ask each of you, and then they each write a response essay, and then the speaker finally responds at the end and says, here is what I think about it. usually without reaching any firm conclusions, but it's an excellent way of dialogue. And I think it's particularly interesting because you've got, like we've suggested, we start non-scientists asking for more scientific people, oftentimes, what they think about it. Yeah, the, and, and the format sh- uh, should, uh, the important thing to, to realize about the format is that this isn't a simply a point-counterpoint debate. Uh, this really is a discussion. It right. it started as a discussion. It mm-hmm. continued as a discussion. Now, this doesn't mean that we just uh, papered over our differences, it, but it, it does mean that we approached these issues in a, in a very different way. So there were a number of times that we met in which the discussion was very freewheeling. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then as the meetings progressed, we then organize them into the format that you see in which mm-hmm. there would be uh, a Southern Baptist uh, professor who would act as the moderator for that meeting. And at that meeting, each viewpoint would be presented in a brief essay, mm-hmm. and then there would be follow-up questions. And And so I think the chapters uh, really do, I think, um, capture uh, the, the nature of the dialogue uh, if you'll notice, the first half of the book addresses theological, biblical, and philosophical questions. Things like, uh, what is what is the, an organization's understanding of biblical authority, uh, the problem of evil, divine actions, uh, divine action, things of that nature. And then the second half of the book is focused more on scientific issues, whether it's mm-hmm. gen, uh, genetics or, or geology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's look into some of the material in this book here. And Dr. Ron, I'd like to start with you. It's a question that comes to my mind here. Is on page 129, you have this statement in response to Daryl Falk here. It says, if evolutionary mechanisms possess such cap- capabilities, then believers and non-believers alike wonder what role is a creator to play? For example, evolutionary biologist and atheist Richard Dawkins script Although atheism might have been logically tenable before Darwin, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. I debated de- development or biologist Paul Zachary Peasy Myers, a well-known atheist and author of the award-winning blog Ferengula at North Dakota State University on Darwin Day, February 12, 2015, no question of God's existence. One of the key points Myers made was, in effect, evolution can explain everything in biology, so why do I need to believe in God? And then later on in that, that same page, a separate paragraph, the key lesson from my interaction with Myers and other atheists is that to make a case for a creator of Christian faith is incumbent on us to, one, distinguish our models from those that are materialistic, and two, identify places where God has intervened in life's history. If we cannot, it is hard to convince skeptics that our creator exists. Okay, so my question is, as I, as I read this, and I'm someone who has studied metaphysics some as well, uh, I think I, I find it a bit problematic because it seems like it it has to be a god of the gaps, and that if God doesn't create 
specifically in a certain way, and it looks like, like God is out of a job. And that, that just strikes me as a problematic position. I'd like to know what you think about that. Yeah, well, you know, I would I would stand behind that statement. And of course, you know, I did pick two rather extreme examples of evolutionary biologists who are actively promoting an atheistic worldview and using evolution as a way to do that very thing. But in my experience personally, when I was a, a an undergraduate and I was learning about the evolutionary paradigm and again, you know, was kind of assuming a position of agnosticism, learning that evolutionary mechanisms could essentially account for the origin, the history, and the design of life only reinforced my position uh, as an agnostic. It didn't, uh, you know, push me towards a position that maybe God employed evolution as a way to create. And in fact, I meet scientists and I meet students of science all the time who take a very similar perspective uh, that, again, uh, it, we don't, you know, if we have evolutionary mechanisms that can account for everything in life, then, you know, we don't need the God hypothesis. So in my experience, pragmatically, if you really want to engage people, you have to do something to jar them away from this idea that evolution is a grand unifying theory that can account paradigmatically for everything that we see in biology. Otherwise, many times people that are entrenched in that position simply will not budge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I don't see it necessarily as a God of the gaps kind of an argument because I'm not a per person who would take the position that, for example, with the origin of life, that there are no mechanisms that exist that can explain the origin of life. I do believe that from a, a chemistry and a physics standpoint, that the mechanisms we need for abiogenesis to happen do in fact exist. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that those mechanisms will not operate in a productive manner under the conditions of the early earth. And in fact, this is the major issue right now when you engage original life researchers is how do we translate the discovery of these mechanisms in a controlled laboratory setting to the uncontrolled conditions of the early earth. And in fact, uh, these researchers recognize that as intelligent agents, they are actually influencing the outcome of their experiments and this causes them great concern. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but the point here is that uh, there are a number of scientists that work in the original life question, that work in evolutionary biology, that are ready to admit that we don't have explanations for, or satisfying explanations at least, for key transitions in the origin and the history of life. And that there are places where you can see, again, failed predictions. And so from my perspective, these are things that are at least sufficient enough for someone to say, wait a minute, maybe evolution can't account for everything. And if so, is it possible that somehow a creator is involved? Mm -hmm. And one could posit process, one could posit intervention uh, in a direct personal way or some combination of both, which is actually the view that I hold. Uh, but I, until you get people to recognize that evolution lacks complete sufficiency, uh, in my experience, pragmatically, you're never going to get those people to move uh, move away from a, a skeptical orientation to one that's open to a creator. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, before I get a response from Dr. Stump, uh, Dr. Kipfli, um, as a theologian and such, what's your thoughts on, on question and the response? Yeah, uh, the one thing I heard, if I if I understood the nature of the question, the the expression "God of the gaps" is mm -hmm. automatically uh, pejorative, mm -hmm. and without a doubt, uh, many, perhaps even most, arguments from a lack of information or lack of knowledge mm -hmm. has turned out to be the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. However, and uh, Jim is the is the philosopher in this in this conversation. He can correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. But um, a properly constructed uh, God of the gaps argument is a, uh, is a legitimate argument. In other words, it isn't uh, automatically a bad argument because it is a God of the gaps argument. Mm -hmm. uh, many, many of them have turned out to be poorly constructed and, and, and a mistake. However, 
it could be. And in other words, uh, I think that if you have certain types of divine action, and, and Jim has written some excellent stuff on divine action, there are certain types of divine action uh, a, that we will call a sign or a wonder that we cannot have uh, a, uh, there's nothing in the prior moments or the moments leading up to it that predicted or uh, uh, lent uh, any reason for us to expect uh, the anomaly would happen. In, in other words, a, mir- a miracle is is almost a disruption of the nexus of cause and effect uh, of what we of what we would expect. Mm-hmm. So, it could be uh, looking at a natural history uh, because we believe that God is the providential God taking care of each and every moment, near, each and every molecule. That's the typical way, in the ordinary way, in which God is operating. God can so choose because He is sovereign to interact with creation in a way that we would discern that in a way that we'd almost, we, we would end up calling that a miracle. Um, I think one area, one, one example of this in which everyone is scratching their heads is in the fine tuning argument. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a rather serendipitous thing because there's nothing in the biblical record that would uh, say, you know, a doctrine of creation, a properly mm-hmm. uh, a robust theology of creation would require uh, a fine-tuned universe. And yet that is what we find. And the more we look at it, uh, the more that you either have to say this looks like some type of divine action or else you have to posit mm-hmm. some really, really um, some very wild, wild metaphysical explanations like the multiverse. So automatically uh, dismissing the, the God of the gaps argument, I think is a mistake because there can be those times and places in which you look at it and say, as, as Fuzz has already alluded to, the origin of life issue. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that this is going to be a question we're going to be able to prove one way or the other as he's indicated. But I think it is a reasonable thing to challenge the standard evolutionary paradigm uh, I, and of course, I may need to ask Jim, what is the standard evolutionary paradigm today? Because I don't think there are very many practicing uh, biologists who would call themselves neo-Darwinian. I may be mistaken about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think that that uh, just saying that the evolutionary paradigm can explain all the phenomena that we see, I think that I think it's a reasonable thing to challenge that. Okay. Now, so uh, Dr. Stump, you've been turning to you, I think, we can have both what Dr. Keefley asked and what uh, Dr. Rana said there. First off, what is the classical evolutionary paradigm being discussed today? And second, what do you think about Dr. Rana's answer? I mean, do you think this is a God of the gaps? Do you think he has a point when we're talking with non-believers about how we approach the question of evolution? Yeah, so these are uh, fantastic questions. And... Uh, I think the evangelistic motivation that Fuzz describes is laudable and one that Biologos agrees with. Mm -hmm. And we uh, wholly agree with Fuzz's critique of Dawkins and Myers and and, uh, these scientists that give science a much uh, bigger scope than uh, in in terms of explanatory power than, than we think there ought to be. And so even it's uh, on that evangelistic theme, it's not the primary goal of Biogos to uh, persuade everybody to believe just like we do. It's much more so to try to show that people who accept the science of evolution can be faithful Christians too. And we're happy for this to be an issue about which Christians can disagree. And so similar to Fuzz's experience, we have experience too, where every week we hear from people that um, feel have feel that they've been made to choose between their faith in God and what, at least to their minds, they think science has discovered about the world. So it's been our goal to try to show how those can be consistent. Um, so I think that shows to one of the points about the evangelism uh, approach here is that people become Christians for lots of different reasons. And I, I don't know that we need just one evangelistic approach to either attract people to the faith or to keep people in the faith who might otherwise go out. So in that regard, I think both reasons to believe in biologos have, have valid ministries in that regard. The God of the gaps question is, yeah, it's one that's tricky um, because science can't explain everything. 
And so there are gaps. If that's what if that's what we mean by a gap is something that science can't explain, then we all think that there are gaps, right? Mm-hmm. And it's been my approach, and I don't know that I want to identify this with the BioLogos approach as much as my own uh, that's consistent with BioLogos, to say that um, framing the question even in terms of uh, gaps within scientific description or interventions into the natural order thing of things. I think that kind of talk uh, implies or assumes that there's a self-contained system that runs on its own just fine for most of the time, according to these natural laws, and that miracles or God's intervention are somehow violations of that. And I don't think that's the right picture to begin with. I don't see how you get away from an implication of deism of some sort or of some degree when we assume that scientific processes describe the way things can run on their own, but then sometimes God has to do different things. Instead, I prefer to talk about the scientific description of things only tells part of the story. It tells a very impressive story and one that does well in explaining some aspects of reality. But I think the laws of nature are descriptive in that sense rather than prescriptive. They're descriptive of what we have observed and their abstractions to ideal cases. And there's nothing in that then that prevents us from thinking that God might do something different in some, in some instances. Mm-hmm. So that it might be our experience that we've observed that people who die and are dead for three days don't come back to life. But that's a description. It's not this must be the way nature works for all time. Mm-hmm. And so God may, may very well do something different. And then we would say our Science doesn't have an explanation for those things that God does different in that. Not to belabor this point, but if I could just offer a very quick follow-up sure. uh, about this idea of, of God of the gaps arguments, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, I actually am in strong agreement with everything I heard from Jim and everything I heard from Ken. Uh, so there's not much, I think, by way of dispute. And, and by the way, uh, just with regard to this question of evangelism, if I meet somebody and evolution is very, you know, is the is the issue, I would never ever want to put evolution as a stumbling block in front of the cross. And so mm-hmm. I have no problem referring people who are deeply committed to an evolutionary explanation, again, for the origin and the history of life to biologos, uh, if that is what they need in order to, to evaluate the truth claims of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Likewise, you know, I do meet people who, when you tell them, well, maybe God employed evolution to create, they roll their eyes and they're not impressed with that argument. And so the people that we're trying to reach are people that would be in that category. Now, with respect to the God of the gaps argument, you know, um, one of the things that we do at Reasons to Believe is we work very hard not to just simply say, here's an absence of understanding that we have, therefore God did it. But rather, we, we try to look very carefully at the nature of the gap. And is there additional information, additional data that would suggest that uh, not only is there an absence of understanding scientifically, but is there additional information that would suggest a creator's involvement? And so when it comes to the nature of biochemistry, I see biochemical systems as displaying unbelievable, unbelievably elegant design and design so uh, profound that it allows us to rejuvenate the watchmaker argument uh, for God's existence in a, in a powerful and in in exciting new way. Mm-hmm. And so when you couple that with the inability to explain the origin of life, now you've got a, a, an instance where you could say, this looks like a place where God could have indeed intervened. How exactly that looks, again, is, is open for discussion. Mm-hmm. So I think that we're making God of the gaps arguments but rather, we are saying that there are places where the evolutionary paradigm doesn't have explanatory power. And if that, and in those particular instances, does it look like there is additional evidence that suggests the creator's involvement? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and as I was thinking about this, I thought that, you know, my area is history mainly, and especially resurrection. And some people could say, well, you've got a God of the gaps if you think Jesus rose again. So, but no, we've actually got the same 
positive evidence. It's not just, hey, there's a missing body, must be resurrection, that here's all this data we have to explain and what's the best explanation, and that one, I think, is resurrection. Yeah, and I think that, um, I, I, I think what you hear, uh, Nick, is mm-hmm. the three of us uh, basically agreeing uh, that we, yeah. we believe that that God in his providential work is just as sovereign in everyday ordinary right. activities mm-hmm. as he is whenever he in a, he involves him, himself in a way uh, that we would consider to be a wonder, uh, mm-hmm. to be to be something marvelous. Right. Uh, if you'll notice, the Bible really never describes uh, miracles in the in the way that one typically sees it described, you know, as some type of violation of nature. Uh, I think Jim did a very good job of saying, look, we're, all we're doing is describing. We're not prescribing. The, the way the Bible uh, describes miracles is these are those times that God has acted in such a way that it is intended to say something to us, to profoundly uh, move us in a sense of worship and awe and wonder. Because in, in the biblical worldview, God is intimately involved all the time. Uh, and I think all all of us would want to affirm that, regardless yeah. uh, what whatever is the ordinary. None of us want to have anything that smacks of deism. Mm-hmm. We do not think that the the universe is self perpetuating. We do not think that the universe is self sustaining. We think that everything about the universe is sustained by by the goodness of God's uh, sovereign power. Mm-hmm. So. In that sense, I don't think that there is any kind of disagreement between biologos and reasons to believe. Mm-hmm. The questions they're having, though, uh, that has to do with, um, I guess, I guess the, the the question we do have then is that okay, when when is it a a reasonable thing to say? Well, this looks like a first order divine action, and um, that isn't just a problem scientists have. Uh, theologians struggle with that too. Yeah. As I was thinking about what you were just saying there, I think one example of how that you you kind of you know, came about how just because we know how some more how God works, it doesn't mean the wonder of it is gone. I think the example of that I go to is how the Psalms say that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made. Well, we know a whole lot more, no doubt, about the whole process of forming of that child in the womb than David did back then. I mean, he knew the basics, of course. It takes sex to make a baby, but we know a whole lot more about what goes on. And I don't think that caused any one of us to say that, well, since we know that there is a fully materialistic process behind it, it means we're no longer fearfully and wonderfully made. Right. <laughs> yeah, now, and even and even then, whenever <laughs> even whenever there are natural phenomena that can be used to explain what's going on, Mm-hmm. If it is so remarkable and so amazing, if you if we were being pursued by an enemy army and we were backed up against the Red Sea, and just as we get to the Red Sea, an east wind comes and blows against the wind uh, against the sea, so there's dry land. Mm-hmm. Even though right. you can you could say, okay, that has a natural explanation. There was mm-hmm. a that must have been an amazing east wind. It, it's got a natural a natural explanation, and yet it is so unique, so timely, so remarkable that we'd say right. this surely is the hand of God. Right. Okay, uh, Dr. Stone, let me ask a question for you then. Uh, I'm trying to ask the hard questions I can for each of your positions here. Dr. Stone, if there was anything I think would keep people from the evolutionary perspective many times, it's that as many of us are evangelicals, we Today, we want to hold that Bible in a very, very high esteem. And too many times it looks like the evolutionary paradigm would seem to go against the, the biblical account. And a lot of people look at biologos and say, well, you got so many people there who seem to be ready to throw out biblical inerrancy, but evolution is something that you, know, you absolutely have to, to hold to. And I think that can be very problematic to some people. I mean, can you really believe in evolution as is in believing in the inerrancy of Scripture? 
So um, inerrancy has been an important concept mm. and even a rallying cry for uh, some segments of Christianity. Yes. And certainly not all of Christianity, though. I mean, I think it's uh, at least the particular understanding of inerrancy that stems from the Chicago Statement and so on is pretty well confined to American evangelicalism. Mm. Um, I it, There's an int- – the – is it a four views book? Ken, you probably know four views on errancy or it's five views. Five Mike views. Bird is in five views. Yeah. But I Mike actually just Bird, started reading uh, it recently. <laughs> did you? Yeah. So as somebody from outside of the U S has a particularly interesting take on our uh, discussions on inerrancy. Um, but here we are, we are American evangelicals. So mm-hmm. we'll talk about it from within that context. And there are, so Biologos doesn't have an official position on inerrancy. There are people within the Biologos community who stand by it and, and don't see a problem with holding to it and to the science of evolution. And there are others who don't think it is particularly a helpful term. And I myself don't go around calling myself an errantist, but neither do I think that it does uh, anything particularly helpful to affirm inerrancy while at the same time admitting that we must interpret scripture and that our interpretations are not inerrant, mm-hmm. right? right? So instead, I affirm that scripture is inspired and that it's authoritative for the church. And I think it prevents us from having to do a lot of gerrymandering with with problematic texts. Well, we affirm inerrancy, but say, well, this must not be what was intended here. And so I'm happy to, uh, to speak of scripture as the word of God and, and that God inspired it and that it's authoritative for the church. And at the same time, I think all of us acknowledge that it bears the marks of the, the human communities within which uh, scripture originated and using their languages and their cognitive environments. So the question about whether evolution sits comfortably within the biblical worldview is not different in kind, may perhaps different in degree, but not different in kind from asking whether heliocentrism fits comfortably within the biblical mm-hmm. worldview. Mm-hmm. These are modern concepts that that were not part of the human cognitive environment in which scripture was given to us. And so, yes, there will be some tensions in that regard. And it's the biologus approach to try to separate out uh, what are those marks of the, the human perspective, the human worldview, the cultural environments within which scripture was given, as opposed to the message that God is conveying to us through scripture and that God revealed himself in certain ways to these, to these communities. Anyway, uh, Dr. Keefley, I've been involved actually quite a deal in the NRNC debates uh, listeners of the show know my father-in-law is Mike Lacona, and so when mm-hmm. he became the target of an inerrancy inquisition, I was very, very to leap to his defense and such. So I've seen inerrancy being used as a weapon, and mm-hmm. I do have a problem with that approach. I definitely agree with what Dr. Stump said, that, we, that I hold the inerrancy of scripture, but not to the inerrancy of interpretation. But what do you think about the question and the response? Because, I mean, even if me of us won't form the inerrancy inquisition, inerrancy, it does seem to play a pretty big role to evangelicals, doesn't it? Yes, uh, I am an inerrantist, uh, mm-hmm. and I, I teach at an inerrantist institution. Uh, mm-hmm. The Baptist Faith and Message uh, mm-hmm. is the guiding document, confessional document, uh, that informs uh, uh, it, 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 it is where we as Baptists are at at this time, mm-hmm. uh, and I am comfortable calling myself an inerrantist. I understand uh, everything that uh, Jim has just said, yeah. and I understand that what, what your, your point. Certainly, uh, there are those who have used inerrancy as a weapon, mm-hmm. but for crying out loud, what, what, what important truth hasn't been used as a weapon at one time right. or another? Uh, so the fact that the fact that some have been treated unfairly and unkindly, uh, that, 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 that's something we take very seriously and be very concerned about. But that is not uh, determinative for whether or not I hold to inerrancy. Right. Uh, I hold to inerrancy because I think the Bible is true in all that it affirms. I think that we do have to be very careful, and I do think the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy 
is a is a a very a very valiant attempt to do that. I mean, when one uh, I, I teach the Chicago Statement practically every semester uh, in my first semester theology class, where we go through the the nineteen affirmations and, and denials of the Chicago Statement, and I've had a lot of students come up to me and say afterwards, "Well, I didn't think I was an inerrantist, but after." After we've gone through those, uh, I find out I really am. If that's inerrancy, then I'm an inerrantist too. Mm -hmm. Because we really do pay attention to things such as the the uh, worldview of the script in, in which the scripture was given. We do look at things such as you know, as you just got through saying, yes, scripture's inerrant. Uh, my interpretation of it is not. Uh, so therefore, there will always have to be a certain amount of humility in our affirmations and and uh, our, our claims because you know you have certain times and examples in history where uh, certain claims were made that we had to backtrack uh, about and certainly the Galileo uh, affair uh, is a good example incidentally Ted Cable has a very good book in which he goes through that uh, that whole issue about uh, the Galileo incident with the Catholic Church, and and if they had followed the hermeneutics of Galileo, they would have been much better off uh, because uh, Galileo pretty well described his approach to Scripture and how it relates to science in a way that is quite congruent with someone who holds to. Uh, the authority, inspiration, infallibility, and yes, inerrancy of Scripture. Um, one of the things that this does highlight is that even though we are discussing creation and evolution, the things that we are uh, engaged in and the points that we're touching are, are actually much broader. And so what happens is uh, to pull the, the inerrancy thread, uh, I think, uh, the concern will be there's a sleeve will come over, uh, will fall off on the other side that we weren't even thinking about uh, whenever we decided that thread can go. And so that has happened. We can see in many of the discussions that uh, are even on the Biologos side, uh, mm -hmm. some that I've followed with interest, uh, because what one holds to the way that we, we you, you know, I'm thinking now of the various uh, I don't know if I want to use the word factions, but the various the various groupings or the various types of people who hold to evolutionary creation, some uh, want to be inerrantists. John John Walton calls himself an inerrantist. Mm -hmm. Peter Inns does not, and the, as a result, there there's other areas that they end up being affected by this. One's understanding of original sin, one's uh, understanding of the atonement, uh, one's understanding of the uh, infallibility of the New Testament. There's a lot of other issues that come up and end up, end up being affected by this conversation. And so as somebody who is a systematic theologian, and I'm always thinking, uh, trying to always think about how this is going to impact the whole, uh, that's one of the reasons why, uh, that's why, that's why we have to be very careful about, um, for the sake of being able to reconcile a scientific question to scripture we've got to make sure that that uh, we don't we don't we don't lose something in the process before i go to dr ronner's he says um, dr keefe you, you mentioned ted cabal there is a book yes. you're talking about controversy of the ages yes it, yes i uh, thank you for uh, bringing that up and, and uh, uh ted Ted is trying in that book is trying to argue that the age of the earth really is not something mm -hmm. uh, that that inerrantist uh, should be uh, falling out about. You know, Dr. Mm -hmm. Cable uh, teaches at at Southern Seminary, and he is a an inerrantist, and he demonstrates uh, that the age of the earth issue is not one. One does not have to hold to a young earth in order to be an inerrantist. Mm -hmm. um, I suspect, <clears throat> I mean, that is one of the one of the things I have said to the people at Biologos, and you know, whether or not they want to to have a broad tent approach is certainly, you know, that's their prerogative. But if they want to see uh, evolutionary creationism, uh, if they want it to be attractive to conservative evangelicals, then they do need to demonstrate how it can be. Uh, how one can be an evolutionary creationist and still affirm something that looks an awful lot like an inerrancy. 
Mm-hmm. For otherwise, you know, it, it will be a convictional thing where people just say, in principle, I'm just not going to be able to go there. Well, I was asking because if anyone's interested, we, we do tend to have a lot of interviews on here. If you go to July 1st of this year, we inter- interview Dr. K. Barr on that book, Controversy of the Ages. So if you're wondering what Dr. Keefley is talking about, what this book is like, go back to the archives and listen to that. Now, Dr. Rana, what's your response to all this? Because if I'm correct, Reasons to Believe is an organization that does hold to inerrancy and such. I don't think there's any bending on that. So, I mean, what do you think? Do you think you could be a consistent inerrant as Christian and hold to evolution? I mean, do you think that Biologos is maybe being a bit too lax on the Bible here, or what? Um, well, you know, as you said, Nick, um, you know, at Reasons to Believe, we hold a view that is probably identical to that that uh, of Ken Keithley, mm-hmm. that we do affirm, you know, the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy. That is actually an organizing document in the work that we do at Reasons to Believe. Mm-hmm. And we would agree, you know, with the points that, that Jim makes, that that we've got to be very careful as we interpret scripture and in taking into account the cultural setting, uh, the, 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 the ideas that were in play as part of the culture at the time. But we would argue that because scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, it is in fact possible to have ideas that would be understood or even embedded in the culture of that time, but yet the concepts that are expressed actually are the true concepts that through eventually scientific discoveries here, you know, in the 21st century, that we can actually see the divine nature of scripture itself. So for example, uh, if you look at Genesis 1-2, you know, here you have this depiction of the earth in its primordial state. And it's remarkable to me how well that depiction matches what we now think the conditions of the early Earth would have been like uh, from planetary science and in the science of solar system formation. And so, you know, here is an instance where, again, you could easily understand that passage of Scripture in the ancient Near Eastern context, but yet it's remarkable to me how the concepts that are communicated about the Earth in its primordial state match in a remarkable way what we now think to be the case, again, regarding the early Earth's conditions. Or if you go to Isaiah 45, 18, which is an allusion to Genesis 1, 2, where uh, according to the prophet Isaiah, God says that he did not create the earth to be uninhabited, but he he formed it to be full of people, full of life. And, you know, again, you see ideas in science like the rare earth hypothesis that, again, is is remarkable in that it's talking about just the fact that the earth very well may be rare, if not unique, in its capacity to support life. And so you can see kind of an an overlap in the concepts that are found in Isaiah 45, 18, and again, what we're seeing from modern science. And so, you know, as a general principle, because we believe Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, uh, that even though, again, it may be written in, in a particular historical context, that there are still, again, ideas or concepts that will find affirmation as we learn more and more about the world around us uh, through scientific investigation. You know, and if there's anything that I've come to appreciate over the years of working at Reasons to Believe, even though we are day-age creationists, is that interpreting Genesis 1 is not easy. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think the big picture ideas of Genesis 1 are very clear uh, in terms of the perspicuity of Scripture, but the specifics of how to understand Genesis 1 is is not an easy thing. And, you know, I find, for example, elements of John Walton's ideas to be appealing. I find elements of the framework hypothesis to be appealing. I find the analogical day ideas to be appealing. I think there's elements of our view that are appealing. And, you know, and I could, you know, go on and on. I think this idea that Genesis 1 may be an apologetic or against ancient Near Eastern ideas is appealing. And so I think probably the way to think about Genesis 1 is, you know, like the elephant that the blind men are, are grabbing various parts of. And so we all have, I think, facets of, of insight as to what Genesis 1 is communicating, but I don't think anybody has put it all together. But I think to, to rob the text of 
scientific content, I think, really does a disservice to the notion that it is indeed inspired by uh, by the Holy Spirit. I think the Holy Spirit would be capable of of communicating in a particular historical context, but yet communicating in a way that is for people of all ages. And we are a scientific world, and, and so we're going to read things through a scientific lens. And what's remarkable to me is that even when we read Genesis 1 through a scientific lens, we do see concepts that match um, contemporary science. Now, you know, could somebody be an evolutionary creationist and see, you know, again, that that position being compatible with a, a, a faithful reading of Genesis 1? I think what Biologos has done is shown that that indeed is the case. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I don't dispute that, that notion whatsoever. In fact, uh, I've, I've met a few people who are very interesting, Jim. Uh, they are basically evolutionary creationists that are concordists that would agree with our approach in a broad sense of Genesis 1, but yet would argue for an evolutionary history of, of life on Earth. So um, there are even positions that I think I don't typically see represented uh, by biologos that are out there under the umbrella of evolutionary creationism. So there's a, a number of ways, I think, to go about, again, how we would understand the relationship between evolution and the, the creation accounts. And so I would never shut the door on one particular view, but rather I would rather adopt an approach that let's put all these ideas on the table and and let's wrestle through them together. And I think through that process, we're going to find you know, positions that will emerge to the top of the heap that seem to be more robust than others. And those represent landing points for people who are part of the church and for people who are outside the church that are contemplating Christianity. Mm-hmm. And Nick, this, Nick, this brings yeah. up uh, an important point that goes yeah. back to the, to the uh, message of the book. Yeah. Um, the reason why Biologos and Reasons to Believe had this conversation is because both organizations are convinced that, that this was a conversation between evangelical brethren. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so that that you know, in other words, we did not. We we may have our disagreements, but we don't consider them those with whom we're disagreeing to be outside the pale. Yeah. Uh, so if you read the book, you know, I encourage everyone in the audience to purchase it and read it. It is a very friendly discussion. Uh, to get to Could I say one more thing about uh, inerrancy then in uh, friendly uh, discussion terms? <laughs> I was wanted to come back to you and get your final thoughts, Dr. Stump, on everything you've heard. And as well as also, I'd like to hear what you think about what Dr. Keefley had to say about the whole thing that if you're going to be persuasive to evangelicals, that right. the point about, you know, you need to have something that does look like inerrancy to them at least. Yeah. And yeah, so I just wanted to say that I'm not at all against people in affirming inerrancy. I'm not trying to persuade people that they shouldn't. My point was that I don't think it solves any questions particularly, because Mm. as Ken said, we we say that the Bible is true in all that it affirms. Well, Mm -hmm. what does that do? It pushes the question to what does it affirm exactly? And the example Fuzz just came is an interesting one in this regard about Genesis 1 and the picture it gives of the early earth. And we might ask then, what is scripture affirming in this case? Is it affirming that's the way the earth was? Because then you get to Genesis 2 and you see a very different picture of the early earth. In the day that the Lord God made the heavens and earth, there's no plant, no herb of the field yet. There hadn't been any rain. And we have this dusty place that God then forms of human out of the dust of the earth. And so we might just as well ask, what is Genesis 2 affirming about the state of the early earth? And so that immediately makes us say, well, my commitment to inerrancy isn't going to solve this question because now I have to uh, do this other hard work of trying to understand the cultural environment, trying to understand our current scientific knowledge and yeah. applying these things in ways that it that it doesn't just read right off the page of what I'm supposed to affirm or what, or what scripture affirms in, in these particular cases. Yeah, I agree with you entirely. I, I think if when we're presented with biblical problems or contradictions or whatever, if we just say inerrancy over and over, we're not answering the questions at all. It reminds me of when Mormons have visited us before and I've presented problems of the Book of Mormon and all I hear is, I have a personal testimony from the Holy Spirit that Joseph Smith was a prophet in the Book of Mormon from God. 
every single time. And I'm sort of thinking, you're not answering my question. And I think this illustrates a problem here. So I guess my point in this is just to try to say that inerrancy is a little more flexible of a doctrine yep. than I think it's sometimes been assumed to be. And within that flexibility, as as Fuzz affirmed of us, yep. uh, within the flexibility of that, I think evolutionary creation can be seen as a consistent doctrine with affirming yep. that high view of scripture in that way. Yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I'd like to remind when you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast, we've got on the show Dr. Fuzz Rana, Dr. Jim Stump, and Dr. Kenneth Keefe here. But if you're listening here next week, and I'll see, I'm not sure, I've had a mix up in our days. We were going to have Brian Godwell on talking about his book, Remnant, or Michael Heiser talking about some arguments for Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm going to be checking those. I just looked at myself and oh my gosh, there might, this doesn't seem to jive with my memory here, but we're going to have one of those next week, at least. But let's get back to the discussion here. Um, Dr. Stump, is there any question you'd like to ask Dr. Rana about his beliefs or reasons for belief or anything <laughs> like that? Well, Fuzz, let me ask. Well, we've had... Um, to follow up, uh, I will do that, but to follow up on what something Ken just said, too, about the nature of our dialogue and how this has happened, um, it's just been, uh, a, I think, a tremendous blessing for all of us to be engaged in these discussions in the way that we have been. I, I, came to, I said I came to Biologos in 2013, and mm -hmm. this conversation with Reasons to Believe was already going on. I think... Do you remember Fuzz or Ken? Was it 2014 when we were in New Orleans together at New Orleans Baptist Seminary? That sounds, it, if it's not right, it's close. Somewhere in there was the first time that I think I met the two of these guys as well. Mm -hmm. And just remember, particularly at that setting, because Nick, for the sake of your audience, mm -hmm. uh, we met, you know, these were not public events. We were meeting, trying to get to know each other, trying to understand each other's positions better. Mm -hmm. And from that event in particular, I remember when we went out to dinner somewhere down in the French Quarter in that upper room where mm. we each got to share our own testimonies and, and talk about us as persons that have these spiritual mm. experiences and so on. And it just changes the register of it the does. conversation about mm. science and faith when you get to know people like that. I, I say quite often about this particular conversation we've had with the, the Southern Baptist guys and with reasons to believe that it's a lot harder to be snippy at each other over the internet when these are people that you've eaten with and worshipped with and mm. prayed together with and so on. So any of the discussion, any of the disagreements that we have, I think need to be understood in that context of people that have become friends. Right. And being friends doesn't at all mean that we entirely agree with each other, right? So, and that's why we're here. That's why we're talking about these things, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I can. First off, I'm wondering, was that at the Defend the Faith conference by any chance, or? No, it wasn't. This was a completely private event that we just met together at New Orleans Baptist Seminary for a mm -hmm. couple of days. And then it was another one at, at Ken's school at Southeastern Baptist, where mm -hmm. we started more seriously putting this, this book idea together. And just as that we really wanted to see this book as the fruit of this long-term conversation that we've had. Mm -hmm. And that makes it something very different. I don't mean to do some shameless self-promotion here, but an, another book that I just edited that came out with is in that counterpoint series on four views of creation, evolution, intelligent design. Mm -hmm. And it has a very different feel to it than this one does because those interactions were not in person. They didn't come out of uh, you know, a long conversation with each other where you got to know each other and understand each other better. Yeah. Um, so that's why I think this book in particular has a really nice angle on these conversations, given the the history that we've had with each other. Yeah, I think it's very good to stress that you can 
like you can be in good Christian fellowship with someone without agreeing with them on everything. I mean, some yeah, the example- and what, when, yeah. While while we were having our discussions and having times in which we uh, disagreed agreeably, then we would then go out. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, uh, Fuzz, help me uh, to remember. We also met in in the Atlanta area, and if I remember correctly. RTB and Biologos held a sort of a joint apologetics public meeting yeah. at that time. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, we met in New Orleans, Atlanta, several times in, uh, at Southeastern. Some of times uh, we would have times of public dialogue. One, one year at uh, the uh, Evangelical Theological Society, we had a panel discussion. The, one of the times we met at Southeastern, we had a public meeting after after our private meetings, we then had a public meeting for the general audience. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I hope that that is something that your your listeners pick up on mm-hmm. is that this wasn't simply we met to debate. Right. Uh, we really met to do what C.S. Lewis called arguing toward the truth. Mm. Uh, in that it wasn't simply meeting for the purpose of one convincing the other. Uh, that he or she is an error, uh, but actually trying to understand the other while firmly holding to to what we consider to be core convictions, learning from the other. And let's face it, uh, none of us come away from this unchanged. And mm-hmm. and we, we were all uh, impacted by the others. And I'd like to think in a positive way. Yeah. I'm not- you know, if I could just add one thing yeah. real quick, you know, along these lines, uh, you know, I think if there's anything that I feel the most proud about in terms of these dialogue, uh, the dialogue that took place between RTB and Biologos, and I hope a dialogue that continues into the future, is that um, that we really were hoping to model uh, for the church, and I think we were largely successful in modeling for the church how Christians can disagree on issues relating to creation and evolution specifically without creating division in the church, but rather creating a sense of unity in the church. You know, because when you look at the young earth, old earth debate that has impacted evangelicalism, I think it's a it's, it's an absolute catastrophe because the net effect is pastors at local churches don't want to address issues dealing with creation or science faith issues because they're concerned that those discussions are going to create division within their congregations, and therefore they sidestep them or avoid them altogether. And the net effect is that you have young people in the church that aren't exposed to the richness of these kind of discussions. They're not exposed to the strengths and the weaknesses of different positions, and given the toolkit for how they can think through these issues themselves in preparation for going off to college, particularly for young people that are Uh, going to go into the sciences or some STEM uh, career. And, you know, survey data indicates that 55, 60% of young people in the typical uh, uh, church youth group are interested in some kind of career in one of the STEM disciplines. And so we're doing a huge disservice to the church if we don't uh, learn how to talk about these very important issues in a civil way that promotes unity, not division. And, And I feel like for the most part, we accomplished that um, with the in our dialogue uh, in the dialogue between reasons to believe and biologos. Uh, so I I see that as being maybe the most significant thing that comes out of this. That's right. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I'd say from my own perspective, I mean, I'm a, an order of creationist who has no problem with evolution, but I just don't sign on my dotted line exactly yet. And I'm married to a young earth creationist who's not dogmatic about it and and happens to enjoy listening to Hugh Ross, which is very interesting. Um, <laughs> my ministry partner and I have some different views on some areas. My father-in-law is a New Testament scholar, and he and I don't even agree on everything on the New Testament. And yet it doesn't change our fellowship. And I think that's the way it should be. Now, Dr. St- uh, what question would you ask Dr. Rana? Yeah, so... <laughs> Fuzz is a scientist, so maybe we should uh, talk. Uh, let him uh, talk about some science mm-hmm. issues at some point. Um, 
particularly, uh, you know, it's no secret that the dominant paradigm and understanding of, of biological science is through the lens of evolution, and Fuzz acknowledges that he's in the minority in that. Um, and so I guess the, the, the question is, Fuzz, when you look at the scientific evidence, uh, you do so, I think, from the perspective of a particular interpretation of Scripture, right? And, and uh, saying, I'm, I really understand Scripture in this way, and so I need to be able to show that the science is consistent with that. Is that a fair assessment, or, or do you think that you can, from the science itself, make the case against evolution in that regard? Yeah, yeah, well, I think from the science itself, you can make a case that uh, the evolutionary paradigm at this point may not be sufficient to completely account for the origin and the history and the design of life. Uh, I don't know that I would take the position that you can you can falsify the evolutionary framework, you know, because I do think that there is evidence that people could reasonably point to that indicates. Uh, universal common descent and, and, and an evolutionary origin for humanity. But I would also argue that that same data could also be understood from a, a design framework. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I look, for example, with much interest on the, the work of uh, Sir Richard Owen, who predated Darwin, who was one of the, the scientists who played a key role in, in essentially codifying the concept of homology and what he called analogies, which we now understand as convergence in evolutionary terms. Uh, but he basically argued that these that shared features that you see among organisms that naturally group together reflect an archetypical design that exists in the mind of the first cause. And he marveled at the fact that you could have this organization of life around a, an archetype and at the same time vary that archetype to produce structures that could carry out a wide range of different functions. And he saw that as design at, at, at the highest possible order. And so, you know, I, given that, again, in, in granted what I'm arguing here is a minority view, given that there are places where the evolutionary paradigm simply can't explain key transitions in the history of life, uh, where there are instances where there does look like there are failed predictions that are that I see as being problematic in terms of this grand claim that evolution can account for everything. And the fact that we can explain these same features from a design framework to me is very intriguing, just simply from a scientific standpoint alone. Um, but you are correct that I do have a particular reading of scripture uh, that does shape the way that I, I look at uh, the science faith interaction. And so, you know, I, I do think that scripture teaches not just Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, but I think uh, both the Old and the New Testament that there was a historical Adam and Eve that's, that, were the, uh, that were the sole progenitors of all humanity, and that human beings uniquely possess this quality called the image of God. And so uh, a big portion of the project that we undertake at Reasons to Believe is can we take this, the scientific data at hand and see if that data indeed harmonizes with that particular reading or understanding of Scripture, which, by the way, is not a peculiar reading or understanding. It, it's, it's a historic understanding, I think, of uh, human origins, and it is a view that many Christians would affirm. And so, yes, there is a particular reading of Scripture that um, does influence how I think about the science, but not completely. I mean, even if I, uh, because I came to faith in Christ again, where the science was clearly pointing me towards the reality of a creator and the deficiency of the evolutionary paradigm, which was shocking to me as a graduate student that was immersed in that framework to see that there was really what I saw to be a glaring deficiency. And, and again, this is an idea that almost every origin of life researcher would affirm that we don't have an explanation for the origin of life. So it's not as simple as scripture is forcing me into a scientific viewpoint, but rather it is uh, kind of a dynamic interplay between what the science seems to be teaching and what, what scripture teaches. So it's not a, an either or, but it's kind of a, a dynamic both and. 
Hey, Dr. Keefley, and you know, as I'm hearing this response from questions that I think for thinking it is, again, an issue that everyone in this side has to struggle with, no matter where you come from, and that's the thing. How are we supposed to assess relationship between scripture and science? Does one come first in our interpretation? Because, I mean, I don't know many of us who would hold to a geocentrist position and say, well, we do this because of what the scripture says, and the science just has to be wrong or anything like that. But sometimes it seems that it could, people do think that if they're going to hold to a position on evolution, they have to go with what the scripture says first and such. And it, it's really complex. I'm probably not explaining it the best way, but what do you think about everything you've been hearing? Well, when it comes to the science, I'm certainly going to defer to the scientist. Mm -hmm. I am not a scientist. And so I do listen to to fuzz and uh, those in which, uh, like during the conversations, uh, whenever, as you can read about them in the book, I, I listen to them with fascination. In fact, during those scientific conversations uh, that we had on our campus mm -hmm. here at the Bush Center, uh, even though it was a closed door meeting, a lot of our faculty members would come in and sit in the back of the room just so that they could hear and listen. And um, because we realized this is outside our area of expertise, he, once one gets outside of his expertise, you know, you are a layman and, and I am a scientific layman and I, right. I want to admit that. Whenever we talk about uh, the relationship between science and faith, uh, this may be something that you, you know, Jim may be the one uh, to, to talk about this more than me because he's actually published about it. There's a number of approaches. Some uh, are more fruitful than others. Some take the idea that the scientific realm uh, and the theological realm are two, two entirely different worlds that, 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 that have no overlap whatsoever. Uh, so therefore, there is not only is there no conflict between faith and science, there can't be because they, they, are, they are dealing with two entirely different things. I don't, I don't know very many evangelicals that would want to go that route. I think we, we believe uh, that I, the God of the Bible is, is the God of history and that uh, God has spoken to us in history, particularly through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what makes Christianity such a unique religion is, is how historical it is. So we do believe uh, that there is going to have to be some type of integration or interaction between the, the findings, our understanding of Scripture and the, the current understanding of science. There are those uh, that will try to shoehorn, you know, whatever, whatever my current understanding of the Bible is, I'm going to have to shoehorn the, Bible, uh, uh, the findings of science into that. Mm -hmm. That's that's less than profitable, and and of course I think that I think Jim would say as an evolutionary creationist he does not want the Bible to be in submission to the latest findings of science. Now, I don't know I don't know any evangelical that hold to that either. What we would argue is is that the Bible is to be the final authority in matters of faith and practice, and the Bible is to sit in judgment in all of my understanding. However. The findings that we see in science can also say to me, uh, it could be that you've misunderstood scripture. You need to go back and take a look at it again, uh, especially whenever the evidence piles up. And so we, we as evangelicals will hold, and you heard even Jim say, I say even Jim, that's, that's a terrible way of putting it. But <laughs> even Jim someone also, like me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Someone like yeah, that's not fair to you. I, I have to the way that sounded. Uh, Jim firms very strongly the authority of the Bible, and the Bible is authoritative in our lives and our thinking, and so it has authority over us and sits in judgment over our thoughts. So therefore, any time that I I am uh, interacting with with the findings of science, and it really pushes back against my current understanding of Scripture, then that would say to me, I at least need to go back and make sure, uh, for example, somebody who was a geocentrist, or perhaps somebody who didn't believe that the earth rotated because, you know, the foundations of the earth are secure and they shall never be moved, uh, the way the psalmist said it. Okay, do I need to go back and take a look at that? And, and you know, is that really what the psalmist was talking about? Um, those are the kinds of things that we, we should do. 
And let me just say, we can do with confidence because we really do believe the Bible is the Word of God. So therefore, we have nothing to fear <laughs> from, from a, a bold examination of the relationship between faith and science. So I would say, as a Christian, we hold to biblical authority, but we believe that there is a, there's to be a, a vigorous engagement. I would call myself some type of soft concordist in the sense that I am not as quite as sure as Fuzz and Hugh are that one can find certain scientific things that they have. I, I, I'm more than happy to have that conversation with them. But I do agree with them very strongly that where that, that, that since the Bible is inspired by God, uh, there are places where we should expect there to be a congruence between the findings of science and a proper understanding of Scripture. And so I think we should find, uh, we shouldn't be surprised when science catches up to the principles taught in Scripture. Now, I like what you said also about how some people are approaching it and say, it has to fit into a text somehow. I, I know Mike Lacona, when he has written about it in his writings, he's referred to that as hermeneutical waterboarding of a text. <laughs> Yeah, uh, or, you know, well, I use the word shoehorning. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's treating one's interpretation as a Procrustean bed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is a dangerous way to approach both scripture and science. Now, Dr. Stump, do you have any response to everything you've heard from your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so in talking about design in particular, I want to uh, go on record here as fully affirming design and in the same way that we fully affirm creation. This is why we call ourselves evolutionary creationists. We believe God is the creator. We believe that God designed us. I believe that God intentionally created human beings in his own image. And I think those are theological claims that I'm making there. Mm -hmm. And when we look to science, one of the approaches of Biologos is to try to limit science and not give science this expanding role of explaining everything. We don't think it can explain everything. And so when you apply design, though, to that scientific discourse, it seems to not explain things as well as, I mean, that's our position. We don't think it explains things as well as, as Fuzz and RTB would think that it does. It, it seems strange to me to use a mammalian skeleton to uh, you to design creatures that run on four legs and design creatures that fly and design creatures that swim as well as our own upright one. If we're going to design something that flies, why not use the same design plan as all the other things that flies instead of having bats be uh, have that mammalian skeleton? The same thing with whales and swimming mammals in the ocean. Drilling down even further, it seems as though the design hypothesis as opposed to the common descent hypothesis starts to break down at the molecular level when we look at DNA and seeing the particular codons that are used to form specific amino acids acids that very easily could have been different if God had been wanting to put some clues in that things were not related through common ancestry. That would have been a fantastic place that you would have kept the exact same macro level design and capabilities of an animal, but to, uh, to change those, those specific sequences that, that could, different sequences that could code for the same amino acids. We're next week then um, on the Biologos blog going to have a new article that discusses this to some extent as well, that the design, the common design hypothesis seems to look at just the similarities between organisms, animals, but that when you look at the differences between them, the specific mutations within the genetic code, it's remarkable that you see this particular pattern of mutation that seems to suggest the differences that we find between individual human beings, which all of us agree are due to genetic mutations, that exact same signature of mutation is found between human beings and chimpanzees and other animals that we think we share common ancestry with. So we think that uh, is, is a, a forced explanation at the scientific level as opposed to it being a theological commitment about the person of God and the macro structure of what of his creation. So we affirm this two books model, right? I think all of us say that, but these kind of conversations drive me to wonder when we talk about the Bible is inerrant and yet we have to interpret it and our interpretations aren't always 
themselves inerrant. Can we say the same thing about the created order that God made, this other book, the book of God's works, that we have to interpret to be sure, but are we going to claim that the, iner- that the created order is errant, that God made mistakes in there? Ken has a, gr- has a fantastic article about the created with the appearance of age um, arguments that are used sometimes. And I wonder if that can't be extended even further to us wondering whether God would create with the appearance of common descent and what that would say about a creator God. I think the same sorts of things might apply there. I like to remind when at this point you're listening to the Deeper Waters podcast, and everything we do here is done through the support of listeners like you. I, I don't pay my guests anything, unfortunately. I wish I could, but I don't. You know, everyone comes on here their own free time and such. We we arrange these kind of things weeks, months in advance and such. And if you want to help us out, go to my website at deeperwatersapologetics.com. And you'll find a link on my side to help support the work of Deeper Waters Christian Ministries. If you click the, the link in the text underneath that, you'll get taken to the ministry of Risen Jesus. You've gone to the right place. As I've said before, that's my in-laws, Mike and Debbie Lacona. And you make your donation to them, then you get in touch with Mike or Debbie or me or my wife, Ari, and say, hey, I made a donation. I want to go to Nick Peters. I want to go to Deeper Waters. And make sure we get your donation and it will be tax deductible entirely, and especially if end of the year giving coming up, we really would appreciate that. You can also purchase some ebooks I've either written or co written on Amazon. Uh, written A Creed for the Ages, for the Apostles' Creed and Today's Christian. Co written, where one that's certainly relevant today would be Defining Inerrancy, a response to defending inerrancy, Groundless, God and Natural Disasters and the Christian answers to this generation's questions. And finally, another way you can support us, and we've got three guys on here, I'm sure they probably know this now, is through the buying jewelry. Because, guys, I'm, I'm sure you've noticed by now that the women in your life, they tend to like jewelry. And some of you might be planning on doing what I did on Christmas Eve or so, Back in 2009, that's popping the question. Well, you're going to need a ring to do that. So why not buy some jewelry through us, through our store at Premier? My friend Lena Cluster runs that. If you want some information on how to do that, just get in touch with me, and I'll help you out. But whatever you purchase, 25% of that goes to Deeper Waters, whatever it is. So guys, uh, you can purchase something to make up that big screw-up that you recently did with a lady in your life. Or you can purchase something as insurance that big screw-up that I know you're going to make with that lady in your life. Speaking of experience, I think we've been there. Now, uh, I'd also encourage you, if you can't donate financially, tell friends about the show, encourage others to listen, and go on iTunes and leave a positive review of a Deeper Waters podcast. I love to see it. Now, Dr. Keefe, do you have an organization or charity you'd like to see people donate to? Well, uh, let me just mention the Bush Center for Faith and Culture is a center at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and we certainly would encourage people's involvement with this. And so uh, you can go to our Southeastern website. We also have the Intersect Project uh, is uh, the blog site for uh, the Bush Center, and uh, you, you can find out more about us and opportunities for you to be involved with us there. Can you give us that website? Uh, Intersectproject.org. Okay. Dr. Stump, do you have an organization you'd like to see people donate to? 
Well, I suppose it's self-serving, but I would uh, pick my own organization of BioLogos. Mm -hmm. BioLogos.org has a give button there. I think there are some people who think we have uh, big piles of money sitting around from the John Templeton Foundation, but that's just not quite the way it works. Mm -hmm. And I think of the organizations that are involved in this origins conversation in the U.S., we have the smallest staff and the smallest budget of all of them. So we would very much appreciate uh, donations here at the end of the year as well. And Dr. Rana, to you. Yeah, again, well, I would uh, say if people are interested in supporting the work of Reasons to Believe, if they go to our website, reasons.org, there's a donate button that they can click on and and support, again, our work with their financial gifts. Also, I would encourage people to sign up for our email list. We have emails that go out on a regular basis that provide people links to articles and podcasts and and um, audio recordings and videos that we have produced that people can access for no cost that point people to how the latest discoveries in science affirm the Christian faith it, with the hope that people will make use of this insight to uh, engage their friends and family members who are non-believers. Mm-hmm. Now, Dr. Anna, is there any question you would ask Dr. Stump? Yeah, um, I've been sitting here thinking about that since (laughs) Jim got to ask the first question. No fair, you had more time to come up with a good one then. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, I guess the question I would have is, um, would there ever be a scientific discovery that you think could take place that um, you would resist because you see it as being entirely counter uh, to the Christian worldview or to your understanding of what scripture teaches. Yeah, I think uh, free will is one of those in in my understanding of things that if we have no such thing as libertarian free will, and I know there's lots of discussions about how to define terms in this regard, but but it seems to me that if we if it can be shown that we're nothing but machines that uh, deterministically follow or even random at the quantum level that randomly follows without agent causing the ability for, as agents to uh, act for reasons and such, that would be deeply troubling to me. Um, and so it's probably fair to put that into the same kind of category as you have with your understanding of Adam and Eve and a de novo creation of human beings, that I would have to resist the science in that regard. I would have to say there must be some mistake here. We can't be, <laughs> we can't be just automatons in this regard and still uh, fulfill the, the calling of God as his image bearers and the ability to, to uh, be morally responsible and so on. Well, Dr. Keithley, I'm uh, sure that uh, this is going to be a very simple one because we know there was no real discussions going on in theology about the relationship of free will and free, and <laughs> God and such. So, I mean, this should be a simple one for you to comment on, right? Well, I think Jim and I are, are very, I think even Jim Fuzz and I are in agreement that there needs to be some type of significant free will in order for creatures to be morally responsible. Uh, to be responsible means to be able to respond. At the very same time, we affirm that God is sovereign and is in control, and he has a plan that from, that he's had from the beginning, and it will be accomplished. There is a purpose uh, that will be fulfilled. Um all Orthodox Christians, regardless, uh, you know, where we're at on the spectrum, uh, would hold to that. I would agree with Jim that to take away free will is to take away our humanity. And I, I, I really want, you know, one can find plenty of non-Christians and even non-theists that are very disturbed by that, mm-hmm. by, by the idea of, of, uh, of us being merely machines. I guess I should say it that way. Yeah, and I, I think something else we can bring out of this as well is the idea that there are mean times that we all would like to say that, well, we just go along with what the science shows. There are mean times that if something, some discovery came up, and even if it seemed the evidence was convincing that, we'd probably all resist it to some extent. Um, I, would, I would ask, since I've got Jim Stump here on the line, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> 
<laughs> Jim, what what does uh, what where, what where does Biologos where are they going with the conversation concerning neurobiology and neuroscience and the issues uh, of um, not just of free will but of the self? Some of the challenges that we see um, among um, uh, in, in the field of neurobiology. What how how does how does Biologos navigate through that? Yeah, so again, and then consistent with our big tent approach, we don't have a certain statement that addresses that uh, particularly. I think in our belief statements where it affirms that we're created in the image of God um, and we make a statement about humans being in biological continuity with all life on earth, but then we say, but also as spiritual beings and that God established a unique relationship with humanity in this regard. So um, if you're asking particularly about things like mind-body dualism, there's not a biologos approved answer on, on that regard. There would, be, there would be people on different sides of, of that position. Um, we're very interested and concerned in this topic of human identity and what does it mean to be human, particularly as it relates to potential advances in, in science and the transhumanism movement, whether that's through augmentation in, uh, you know, implanting chips in our brains or whatever, or through manipulation of the genetic, the genetic code and what that, what that does to what it means to be human. So though that gets, uh, into, into pretty deep bioethical issues that I think the church has to have a voice in as we uh, move forward and, and try to sort out some of those issues about what kinds of things it's permissible to do to uh, to human beings. And I mean, yeah, some days I wish I had a chip in my brain that would help me remember where I put my keys or, or mm. whatever else is going on. Mm. And we wear eyeglasses to correct things about us. We get vaccines and so on. So we're on this path already of trying to do things to improve our lives in various ways. But it gets pretty tricky when you talk about doing permanent things things that alter alter what it means to be a human being. Hmm. I was just uh go ahead. Never no, mind. you go ahead and finish. I was going to say I was just at a at a talk in DC a couple of weeks ago where William Newsom from from uh, Stanford was there talking about uh neurobiology, neuro and some of the ethics that comes into that. And the sorts of the sorts of decisions that are just on the horizon for us are are frightening of uh, being able to, uh, you know, decide what kinds of operations on the human are acceptable and not. So, mm. yeah, yeah, Nick, what this does this this illustrates where the conversation that we're having about uh, the the relationship between faith and science and yeah. creation evolution in particular it really does have a, a ripple effect, mm. and the area of bioethics. Uh, and anthropology is one very clear area in that's going to be impacted by this. This is why we really, we really are trying to to navigate our way through this carefully. As Jim just pointed out, it is one thing to to try to use science, technology, and medicine to alleviate the human condition. It's another thing to try to augment what it means to be a human, mm -hmm. and those those are very big issues, and we are facing them. And unfortunately, in the area of neurobiology and neuroscience, many of the loudest voices not only d deny uh, what we traditionally understood what a human is, and, and they seem to be very free to mm -hmm. want to, uh, many of them to want to, to abandon all notions of free will, they, they seem to be willing to abandon what we even understand to be the self. Uh, and the, these are real problems. Um, we really, we're really going to have – the church really does. I want to agree with, with Jim on this. We really need to get out in front on this conversation mm. uh, because uh, this, is, this is a conversation moving very quickly. Yeah, uh, I would like to, before we lose timings too much, go back to Dr. Rana here. I mean, you asked your question. You've heard a lot of dialogue ever since then. Uh, what's your thoughts about what you've heard? Yeah, well, um, just uh, as on this whole issue of transhumanism – I'm currently uh, working on a, a book with my friend Ken Samples 
uh, on the issue of transhumanism. So this is uh, going to be kind of a wide-ranging book looking at scientific, philosophical, theological, and biblical issues relating to this whole idea of the transhumanism movement and human enhancement technology. And I, I see this uh, probably in the same way that Jim sees this as being, one, something that the church has to be on top of. Uh, we can't react. We've got to be proactive when it comes to this. But um, but I see this as being an issue, to build off of what Ken Keefley said, is deeply intertwined with this whole concept of what does it mean for human beings to be made in God's image? You know, because when you look at anthropology over the last 150 years, there really has been an assault on that idea that, you know, we only differ in degree, mm -hmm. not in kind, according to many um, physical anthropologists. And, and so, you know, if we're going to establish, I think, a, a Christian worldview impact on this whole issue of human enhancement technology, it's got to be from a, a, a standpoint where scientifically mm -hmm. we can show there is something distinct about human beings compared to other creatures. And the, the good news is there is a minority view among anthropologists of human exceptionalism, which I think is a, a very exciting advance in anthropology that I think allows us to, to argue that there is something special about human beings that we can show scientifically that at least lines up with some understanding that people have of what the image of God is. So, I mean, you know, to Ken Keefley's point, this, is, this conversation uh, about the question of human origins really is a very important conversation that has wide-ranging impact, not only in terms of, again, how we, we, we understand the credibility of the Christian faith, but the kind of voice that the Christian faith is going to have going into the future. Mm. I think it's very good that it looks like that despite our differences we can have amongst us on origins, all of us are going to put aside those differences and say, right now, this would be ultimately a more important battle to fight, and we can come back to our secondary differences later. Well, well you know, one of the, the, the dreams that I have is that RTB, Reasons to Believe, and Biologos could actually do more university events that are more collaborative than, than necessarily events where we focus on what, of our, what our differences are and, and discuss those differences, because I think it would be intriguing I, to be in front of an audience of non-believers and to show how there can be these deep, robust interactions about science, faith issues, uh, where there's not necessarily a Christian perspective, but a number of possible viable Christian perspectives. And I think that could be really winsome and really attractive. So I think Nick, to your point that it's great that we can put aside places where we disagree and work together where we agree, but I would even think that in the midst of our disagreements, we could actually work in the midst of those disagreements to actually advance the gospel. And so that would be my dream that we could figure out uh, how to do something like that. I think that would be, uh, I, I think that would be revolutionary. Uh, I agree entirely, and you know, I say we're getting close to the time of things up and I mean I'm sure we're all shocked that here at the end of a discussion of nearly two hours we didn't fully resolve all the theological issues there so uh, I, I'm sure everyone's going to go home disappointed knowing that there are still disagreements there but um, Dr. Keefley where do we go from here I mean we, the book I think is just really opening the dialogue up and such where do you see this going? Well I think uh, Fuzz has indicated where we should go with this and that is we do understand, I think, pretty well as, as a result of these conversations where we agree and where we disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think we understand why we disagree. And there are some issues that I think that we're going to say we're never going to agree about this. Right. As, as on, and that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, something that Jim had said a little earlier about uh, inerrancy and, and how we relate to our understanding of science in that, you don't have to look at science for us to see how inerrantists can disagree among themselves uh, in, ter in terms of interpretation. There are plenty of Wesleyans and Presbyterians and Baptists uh, who are all inerrantists, dispensationalists and covenant theologians. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're all inerrantists, but we still disagree very, very strongly. Uh, cessationists and charismatics, we could go on down the line. Uh, inerrancy doesn't guarantee we're all going to agree on an interpretation. It does give us the authority, uh, holding to the authority of the Bible and holding to the Bible as our guide uh, in our faith and practice allows us to be able to work together uh, despite our disagreements, because we we find that we agree about much more than what we disagree. Mm-hmm. So where we'd go from here, I would argue uh, that Fuzz just got just just said it uh, that I think that uh, we have a good understanding of where we agree and disagree. Now, what can we do to advance the witness uh, for the gospel in all of the arenas, uh, apologetics, in edifying the church? Um, I really am praying that there will be a, a wonderful generation of young people who will go into the STEM fields and will advance the kingdom of God in every arena, including uh, the areas of, of science. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think we could work together and, and really, really have some fruitful endeavors. Dr. Stump, any thoughts on all that? Uh, just that I fully affirm what has been said, and uh, we see ourselves as as uh, rowing in the same direction as these other organizations in terms of uh, hoping to advance the gospel and the kingdom of God, and that the... Uh, things that unite us are much more important and significant than the things on which we disagree. Well, the book is certainly a great example that you can come together on issues that you disagree on and disagree wholeheartedly, extensively, and still walk away on good terms. Um, I think the thing is, if we put all of us in a room together and talk about areas of Christianity and ask what our opinions are, there would be a whole lot more of heads nodding yes in agreement than heads nodding, than heads going no in disagreement. That we'd be united more than we would be divided on many topics. The book's a good start. Hopefully this a dialogue here is another example of it going on, and hopefully, like Dr. Rana said, there'll be many more of these dialogues. Now, with that being said, I think it is about time that we do start wrapping things up. We've got about 10 minutes to go, and normally we do it at five minutes, sorry, but since we got three people here, then we're going to do things a bit differently. Dr. Keefley, do you have a blog, a website, an email where people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Yes, I mentioned uh, our blog site a, a little while ago. Let me just say it again. Uh, the Intersect Project is the website for the Bush Center for Faith and Culture. Mm-hmm. It's called uh, its its address is intersectproject.org, uh, and we, you can um, find out what is going on at the Bush Center and the activities uh, that we are involved in. Also, we have uh, regular articles that speak to the issues of the day, uh, and you can get in contact with me and the other uh, other faculty at Southeastern there. Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave Dave with Deeper Waters audience? Well, uh, I just want to uh, say that how happy I am uh, to to work uh, in this book project with my dear brothers uh, Fuzz and and Jim. And um, like I said before this started, I didn't really know. In fact, I didn't know Jim at all, and I barely knew Fuzz uh, when this started. And um, I I am really glad to know that these men are doing the kind of work they're doing. Mm-hmm. I think they're doing a great service for the cause of Christ. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Stump, do you have a blog, website, and email where people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? So the BioLogos blog can be found at biologos.org. And we've recently uh, redone some of the way that search engines work on our site and so on. So you can click on resources and find all kinds of uh, articles from the blog and other kinds of things that we do there. Um, Biologos is also uh, has a Facebook channel that's pretty active. So you can find us on Facebook at Biologos Foundation. And I think there's a Twitter as well, but I don't tweet myself, so I don't know too much how to how to make that one work. But I'm sure you can find us there, too. <laughs> and do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave for the Deeper Waters audience today? Just uh, to echo what Ken had said about this project as a whole and that it's uh, been just enormously uh, rewarding personally as well as professionally to be involved in a project like this and... Uh, 
perhaps your audience should know that I think that this book would make great stocking stuffer. So <laughs> mm-hmm. I can agree with that. <laughs> yes. uh, um, Dr. Rana, do you have you know, a blog website where people can get in touch with you if they want to find out more? Well, again, I would tell people to go to reasons.org. Uh, and I have a blog that's hosted on that website called The Cells Design. Also, I'm very active on Facebook and Twitter. So if people just want to search for my name, uh, they can follow me on Twitter and they can like me on Facebook. And uh, also, I do a, a Facebook Live broadcast, ideally once a week, called Question of the Week, where I let people through my Facebook page submit questions on science faith issues, and then we'll take the, on those questions during that broadcast so people get a chance to have a way to interact with me through Facebook. And then also one other thing at Reasons to Believe, we just have launched a new vodcast called 2819 uh, that can be found on YouTube. And it's a 30 minute magazine type program dealing with science faith issues, but also encouraging people to do evangelism. Mm -hmm. So the name of the program comes from Matthew 2819. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was also thinking whenever you and Dr. Sampras published that book on the transhumanism thing and such. We would be glad to have it on the Deeper Waters podcast. Well, thank you. Now, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave behind for the Deeper Waters podcast? You know, nothing really much different than what uh, Jim and, and Ken have said. You know, it's really been an, an incredible experience to get to know the, the folks at BioLogos, to get to know a number of Southern Baptist theologians, uh, who I would account all now my friends. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's uh, just been an an amazing experience. And if there's anything that exemplifies what it means to be part of the body of Christ, I think it would have been the dialogues that we've been able to undertake over those last several years. And, you know, my prayer is that these, these interactions can continue on into the future and that really we can serve as an example to the church on how in the midst of differences there can be unity and in that out of that unity we can be very effective as a church in engaging our world. Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Stumper is certainly right also about this book would be a great talking stuffer for those interested. At the time of recording, the paperback is 1944, the Kinder is 2039. If you know someone who's interested in apologetics, science, evolution issues, creation issues and such. Yeah, get this book for them. It's a great read. There are several wonderful dialogues in it. And I'd like to also congratulate and thank all of you because I think this dialogue has gone excellently. It's been very agreeable despite all the differences. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be part of it. Mm-hmm. Yes, I agree. Yes, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming on here today, and I hope to see all of you back here again in some format or way. And I'd like to thank you all out there for listening to Deeper Wars podcast. Next week, we are going to have on either Michael Heiser or Brian Godwell, like Dr. Stump, maybe. I could probably use that chip implant sometime here every now and then for the show. (laughs) But for now, I am Nick Peters, and I am signing off.